Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 51 of the Hooper Cast. Um, I'm Hooper, and this is my cast. Hello, Dustin. Hello, Hooper. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm eating lunch. <laughs> what do you got to eat there? I've got a quesadilla. Oh, from where? From Moe's? No, I made it, man. What? Yeah, dude. I didn't know you cooked, Dustin. I cook all the time. Yeah, you do. You cook all the but, time. But usually just easy foods like that. And burgers. Like, like, yeah, like burgers. Like It's just meat and bread. And then, <laughs> and then this. Sprinkle some cheese in a tortilla and throw it in a hot pan. Yeah. yeah I, can't cook, I can't cook worth a shit. Um, <laughs> I can cook um, scrambled eggs. Um, I love scrambled eggs. I can cook... Um, oh, dear. I don't cook that many yeah. things. Soup? Yeah. That's can't, Soup. can't, yeah. I, yeah, I can't. I, yeah. I remember you always making meat, though. Yeah. That's cool. Like, yeah. you buy a big bag of, like, Walmart I, pork I, chops. Yeah, I'd buy some, yeah, I'd buy that, the frozen chicken and throw them in there. Yeah, man. And get grease burns on the rig. Well, yeah, true. Yeah. You just throw a little olive good, oil in there. Good chicken, though. Yeah, for real. Yeah, it was just boneless, dark meat chicken. Mm. It was delicious. I'm more of a white meat kind of guy. But, I kind of want some right now. But, yeah. Yeah, I like them both. I used to eat, like, way more dark meat than light meat. Um, mm. But, uh, and then I was just like, oh, white meat's better for you. But even at Thanksgiving, I'd still eat the hell out of some dark meat. Yeah, yeah. And the skin and everything. <clears throat> so delicious. Mm-hmm. But then I'd take some of the skin and I'd wear it as a suit. Like Hannibal Lecter. Like Hannibal Lecter or <laughs> Buffalo Bill. <laughs> Hello, Clarice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I've been told to watch that new Hannibal series, and I found out it's on Amazon Prime the other day, so I might be able it to. It is. Yeah. Uh, it, it's pretty good. Um, the, um, the, the showrunner, I can't remember his name, he said he had plans for, like, seven or eight seasons of that show. Like, he'd already planned them out. And then eventually he'll get to the point where he'll start adapting Silence of the Lambs and, you know, Hannibal and all of that stuff, too. So, <clears throat> he's got a plan, which is cool. It's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else have you been watching lately, Dustin? I've been we bouncing around trying in a while. Cause I know. Things have been busy. The, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at asking you a question, but then saying, wait a second, hold on, let me talk some more. <laughs> um, yeah, so, just to, just for the, to give the listeners some, some context, um, there are many reasons why the Hooper cast goes a month without recording. Um, mm. Sometimes we just don't feel like it, and we can do that. Sometimes we hate you. Yeah, we feel feel like you hate us. Yeah, we have lots of content content for you. We um, do. But um, what ha- my, um, my daughter came a month early, um, <laughs> and uh, then I had to uh, bounce around at work and help Mrs. Hooper out. Um, mm-hmm. So. Um, just hadn't been a good time to record. So. <laughs> was so, she a full uh, month early? She was, yeah. But then they're saying wow. like, well, depending, uh, you know, you may have been farther along in your pregnancy when you found out when we found sure. out we were pregnant. But she was still early. Yeah. But she's but she's big. I mean, she was six pounds fourteen ounces. I mean, mm. pretty big for you know what you'd call premature birth. But I wouldn't even sure. call it premature. I'd call her just early, or earlier. Just early. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, See, I was I was premature. I was five weeks early, I think. Oh, and uh, yeah, but you know, it all worked out. Yeah, I was late. I was like ten days late. <laughs> yeah, you made a nice little home. I stayed in there. You're like, I'm I'm not ready to leave yet. Yeah, I stayed in there and grabbed some extra. I was like, what can I take? Some, take some more calcium, a little more <laughs> calcium. You know, yeah, just some. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. spent nine months on that bachelor pad. You couldn't just leave yeah, it. I was like, "Yeah, give me some time to pack, man. <laughs> I can't just can't just kick me out. I gotta get some <laughs> people together, help me move." Yeah, yeah. And those people were called doctors, and they pulled me out. They are. Yeah. After a while, they're just like, "We gotta get him out of there." <laughs> I don't think he's coming out. <laughs> yeah. You'd still be in there today. I'd st- I would, and I'd be some kind of freaking nature. I'd have, like, I'd be completely immune to like, I'd be immune to like AIDS, and just you could. Just do medical experiments on me. I wouldn't die. I'd yeah. be like a mortal man. You'd have just stayed in there. Yeah. But then, but then your younger brother would still have been conceived and born. Yeah. And you and you would just still be in there, like. Yep. Nope. Not yep. leaving. But yeah, she's uh she's out. Hoop Jew is out. 
happy and healthy, um, oblivious to everything else. So yeah, <laughs> she um, she doesn't uh, like. Um, I was talking. Uh, I was telling Mrs. Hooper. I said we've just been calling her Hoop Jew. You know, I, I you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I said it, she said it sounds sounds kind of derogatory. I said it sounds kind of like something I would imagine. Like if you're from Boston and you and, mm -hmm. you, and you, you just got done playing twenty one with some Jewish guys, like it's almost like a rare sect of Judaism. It's like yes, the athletes, you know. <laughs> That's like, true. Yeah, we were playing <laughs> we, were, we were playing horse with some hoop Jews the other day. <laughs> when That's this, so true. When this queer came up, <laughs> it's just <laughs> that was a terrible time to take a drink of beverage. Uh, uh, uh. Carbonation in my throat. Yeah, but I was able to see a couple of um, of movies. But uh, I was curious what you have seen since we last spoke. Well, I've been jumping around trying to find um, a TV show to latch onto. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of having these, uh, you know, television withdrawals, and uh, I, th I feel like I'm probably going to give uh, American Horror Story a chance next. Um, oh. But I've jumped around from like Justified to Luther. You know, uh, following, and um, I just can't really, you know, find anything that's, for whatever reason, you know, gonna gonna grab me. And uh, yeah, so I've been watch watching a lot of those. Um, and I've been knocking a couple movies off my instant queue, um, movies that I should have seen a long time ago, and just never have gotten around to. Like There Will Be Blood, and that's on Netflix. It is. Oh. And um, the grapes of wrath, and yeah, so just kind of knocking some stuff off. All right, I didn't know which, that was which, on there. Yeah, it is. Um, I think I think it's pretty new on there, but yeah, they have Good Burger on Netflix. I just found. No. It. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet because I feel like it'd be too painful. But I know Netflix is doing really well. They got like two million more subscribers or something. Like they're doing really? they're on the upswing. Yeah, and I don't know yeah. if their original content has anything to do with it, but I mean. Mm. I don't know. Well, have you heard about this net neutrality thing? I keep hearing it. I don't know what I, every every like day, like Wired will post a, a, an article about it, but I don't mm. know what it is. Well, I don't understand like the whole thing, but basically, what I think is happening is that they've now decided that internet service providers, so like Comcast or Verizon or whatever, they can now funnel bandwidth to certain areas of the internet that they deem most worthy. So in other words, a top tier site like Google mm -hmm. will load as fast as it always has. But a, like your blog page or, you know, your Facebook page or whatever, Facebook's pretty high, but um, you know, little sites can, can they can now um, best I understand it, they can now choose to limit how fast they will load for you uh, based on how much you pay them. Uh, so it's about money. <laughs> it is about money. It's always about money yeah. with Comcast. And, and so for me, like, the way that I see it, and I don't know if this is exactly how it works, the way I see it is sort of like television. How, like, you have your basic channels, but if you want HD channels, you have to pay more. And if you want... AMC, you have to pay more. You have to like do another bundle. You know what I mean? Right. So I feel like it's kind of like that. Like if you want Netflix to load faster, then you're gonna have to pay them more money. And um, so anyway, but evidently it's a huge deal for Netflix, and they they've like basically said we're gonna incite a riot because you will impede our ability to provide content for our customers if if you say you know. Now Netflix is going to run slower than Google. You know what I mean? So that's the huh. deal. Interesting, and that's yeah. coming whether we like it or not. I guess. Pretty much, yeah. Yay. So, so, so right now, like, let's say you pay for you know, eighteen megabytes. What is it? Megabytes per second or whatever. Um, when you when you buy a uh, an internet package from UVerse or whatever. Right. Well, now. As I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but AT&T now has the ability to say, 
it's 18 megabytes per second if you log on to Google. But if you go to Netflix, it's 16 megabytes per second. And if you go to Facebook, it's 14. And if you go to MySpace, which never gets any hits anymore, then it's, you know, three megabytes per second. And they can, they can like, chop it up and funnel the bandwidth where they deem, you know, it needs to be funneled and where it will be most profitable for them. Well, I guess we'll just have to see how that works out. Yeah. Oh, well. That baby is super cute. I know. Just keep watching her hands move. I know. Keeps just looking around, looking. Look, it's over here. That's in front of you here. Right there. Right at your periphery. If you would just look at it, you'd... <laughs> can you... Can, can, all right, there, there we go. All right. Yay, yay. Yeah. So, okay, see, now you're not drinking it. I'm confused, too. Look at that look. She was like, what? <laughs> I was just about to say that is a that's that's your face like yeah. that's the face that you make. She has those all those those quizzical looks like. What the yeah. fuck are you talking about? Like, <laughs> yeah. yes, <clears throat> those are the Hooper looks. I know. Uh, well, I saw. Um, I, I got to the. Um, I got a chance to see a couple of new releases. Um, mm. I was able to see Lone Survivor. Oh yeah, how was that? That was pretty good. Cool. Pretty, it was pretty good. Um, afterwards, uh, I was I heard about a couple of interviews um, that Peter Berg, you know, the director, was giving, and one of them he's talking to like this Israeli reporter, and so there, it's pretty much established that Peter Berg like really loves America, mm-hmm. and he was just talking about the military, and he was asking the reporter like, so when did you enlist or whatever? He's like, ah, oh, I didn't. He was like, you're from Israel? He's like, yeah. He's like, you gotta join the military, motherfucker. And, <laughs> and the guy's like. I mean, I, I, I kind of fled. He's like, when did you, he's pretty much like grilling him about why didn't you join the military? Like, mm-hmm. the guy's like, okay, we're not talking about that right now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Peter Berg seems like a psychopath, but the movie was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was really solid. And then I saw The Wolf of Wall Street, uh, mm. which was really good. Um, yeah. If I, it would have made my, my favorite movie of 2013. I was really impressed with Jonah Hill. I've really been impressed with Jonah Hill recently. Yeah, he's he's on a roll. I think he'll do he'll do like some weird dumb comedy, and then he'll do he'll, he'll walk out and um, just boom, he'll just be in a Martin Scorsese movie, and then deliver right. you know an, an Oscar nominated performance. Right. Like he was he was my favorite part. I mean, God, him and Leo were both really good. Like that movie, just the writing was good, very good, very good movie. Yeah. Um, also, I would love. I'm, I'll, I'll probably rent it. I'll probably red box it when it comes out. And um, yeah, you know, it's something I'd probably. It's just good. I mean, it's with Scorsese. Scorsese's movies are all solid, except for Hugo. I didn't really like Hugo at all. Everyone just. Well, I like Hugo. Everyone, I don't know. I I feel like that one just missed it for me, but because it, it was it was different from his others, you know. It's, yeah, it was. It was he, uh, I think he was trying some. Yeah. But sort of out of his The Wolf of Wall Street will go in there with The Departed and Casino and, you know, yeah. every, you know, but especially with the, especially with Casino and Goodfellas, the the, the guy's rise to fame in yeah, whatever yeah. his venture is, but most most like Casino, I'd guess. Okay. Um, you know. That's awesome, though. Guy, you know, finds fortune, his wife eventually hates him, you know. Right. And then the, the fall out of fall. his... Yeah, the rise and fall. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So then uh, I, I rented some stuff from the library, um, mm. and I saw... I watched um, uh, uh, Carrie. Oh, yeah. And uh, I really liked it. Like, the first two-thirds of that movie were really good. Um, mm. And the end is good, too, but the end is a lot more generic than the, the rest okay. of the movie, because it's you know the, it's the it's the remake of the, um, the I guess 1976 or something like that. Um, yeah, something. I think it was Brian De Palma did Carrie, and it's based on the Stephen King book about this girl who gets her period and then develops telekinetic powers, mm-hmm. but she's kind of like an outcast because her mom's like a crazy fundamentalist Christian, and so she's you know so people pick on her, but then like she's able to go to the prom and then and um, but then some mean people like pour pig's blood on her, and she freaks out and starts killing people. Um, yeah. So the first two thirds of the movie, 
Um, they're really good. I like Chloe Moretz. She was really good. Um, I do too. Yeah. It's basically you know the first the first act is like it's it's I mean it's a, it's it works for these days because it's about bullying. You know, it's sure. about yeah. picking on people, and they're these bitches are mean to her. <laughs> they are mean, and like most of them, yeah. like after the initial thing, like you know she gets her period, and so they all throw tampons at her, and she's like freaking out and crying because she doesn't know what it is because her mom didn't tell her what her period was. So yeah. like, um, so like they're throwing tampons at her, and they were, and someone tapes it and puts it on YouTube, um, and so, but the and so. Then they all get punished, and that chick is like, whatever, like, she deserved it. And so all her friends are like, I don't know, we feel kind of bad. So she breaks mm-hmm. off, and she's, like, toward the end of the movie, like, when everything's freaking out, they're driving, mm-hmm. and carries in front of the car, and she's like, run her over, kill her, just kill her. And it's like, you're willing to go 100% with this, aren't you? Yeah, that's 100%, you just, yeah. You hate her <laughs> so much that you're just ready, wow. you're ready to kill her. Like, she's, like, it's still believable, but it's like, wow. Like, yeah. you're... I guess we're going all the way with this. There's no going back. Yeah, yeah. So, right, yeah. But she is just me. Just she just wants to ruin Carrie's life. She just she yeah. hates her. Yeah. Um. Anyway, it's uh it's mm. really good, and, and I don't know if this happens in the original movie or not. But one of the girls who feels bad about it asks her boyfriend to ask Carrie to the prom. You know, and, and they're actually nice people. Um, I guess who just have the wrong kind of friends, and you know, so the guy takes her out and so it's really the whole second half is like oh and she's she's she 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 made her dress herself and oh she stood up to her mom and so she's gonna be able to go to the prom and you know and she's having such a great time with the prom and then when they pour the blood on her it's just like (gasps) yeah and there's some graphic deaths in there man like yeah people get yeah it's so it was was it's worth it's worth watching um Mm -hmm. I, i haven't seen the original so i don't know how to compare it but um is that at redbox I got the library. I'm pretty sure you can get it at Redbox. I, I would think you could. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one I saw was uh, Elysium, mm-hmm. uh, the um, the uh, Neil Blomkamp's uh, s- uh, sophomore, uh, sophomore, his sophomore um, film. Yeah. And I did like it as much as District Nine. Yeah. But District Nine was really great. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, it's almost an unfair comparison, but. Um, sure. It has the same like kind of aesthetic. Like it's mm-hmm. a dis- it's um where District Nine was supposed to be like today. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Elysium's in the future. Elysium's like twenty one fifty four. Okay. Which I have I um this is a little bit of a tangent, but I've started a word document mm-hmm. where I've put the movies I own. Mm-hmm. I put them first. I, I categorize them the movie the, the okay. when it came out. Mm-hmm. As if I'm going to watch them all in that order, I guess. And that sure. put them in the order in which they occur. So I have them in chronological mm-hmm. order. So, mm-hmm. of course, when I see the years, I'm like, okay, 2154, that's it's 100 years after Minority Report takes place. And so I'm trying to mm-hmm. make it all fit in the one universe, and it's just fun for me. Right, right. So, mm-hmm. um, but it, much like District 9, the people live in basically like a landfill. There's just trash everywhere. Yeah. Everything's <laughs> shitty. It just looks yeah. bad. Um, so, but um, I, I actually... I was af- I was afraid going into it that because I could tell and you could tell from like the posters and everything it's like mm. in twenty one fifty four you know the gap between the rich and the poor has increased and the rich got richer and the poor got but not just like ah uh. yeah so I was um, I didn't want to see a soapbox about you know income right. inequality because sure. I've made my decision on how I feel about that and. You know, yeah. I don't want to see a movie where people are trying to say everyone should make the same amount of money or rich people should pay more. I just didn't want to see that. Then there's a little bit of it in there. Mm. Um, they kind of just let go of that toward the middle and the end. Good. So um, it's not like someone turns around at the end and goes, "Poor people deserve better." And then it ends. Yeah. You know, <laughs> at least it wasn't you know that. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't as preachy as I thought, but I know that's why Matt Damon. That's one of the reasons he signed on. He did it. Yeah. You know. Exactly. So. Um, and it's just we've talked about this before. I just I can't separate him from his off-screen person. When you can yeah. tell black and white why someone was probably involved in a project, you know. But that's up to well, them. So whatever. But well, see, but that's that's exactly the thing. Like I was thinking the other day about movie stars and why there doesn't seem to be a true like movie icon anymore. Yeah. Like, when you think back, like you you think of like James Dean and Marlon Brando and Marilyn yes. Monroe, Steve and McQueen. 
Yeah, and it's all just like these John are Wayne. icons, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and why there's not that anymore? And I think it's because of the, like the pre- uh, just how prevalent it is that we we know everyone's likes and dislikes and political views and religious. We know views. too much about them. We know too much, and so and so that becomes hard to separate from people. So when you go to a Tom Cruise movie, it's kind of like in the back of your mind somewhere at some point you're going to it, it, Scientology is going to is going to come into your mind. Um, you know, for the most part. I mean, not all the time. Tom Cruise is pretty good, but but the thing is like they all we know too much about people. And so, yeah, I think I think that is why we don't have movie stars is because it's become harder to separate them from their their personal lives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, whereas like what like what do you know about about like James Dean? Nothing, man. Not much, yeah. No. Exactly. Of course granted he only made three movies. So True. He was he wasn't really in the spotlight for that long. <clears throat> right. What's a constant rule of science fiction that I accept is that it is the perfect medium and it and it should serve this purpose of mm-hmm. I, I, speculative fiction is my favorite genre, so sure. I like I like move I I like movies like this where, mm-hmm. um, it's like hey, let's extract let's take a problem we have today, mm-hmm. and let's extrapolate it and see yeah. let's you know let's build a world where this kind of was the biggest issue and continued to be the biggest problem with us for a hundred years, you know, yeah. you know and in their minds rich people are are. Pricks, and so it's like, what if they just got up and left? I thought I, I would get up and leave too if I, if I was stuck on a planet with a <laughs> complaining, the poor complaining people like you. You know, like just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Elysium seemed pretty sweet too. Um, yeah, it's just this big spinning. Yeah, just from the trailers, it looked pretty cool. It's basically like an endless Central Park. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like on a giant wheel. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I'd want to live there. That would be cool. Um, um, yeah. Well, talking about stuff like that, like I was, I, I came up with this a few days ago, and I was talking about it with some people. And <clears throat> there's a movie out now, or maybe maybe it's just about to come out. I don't know. It's called Gimme Shelter. Yeah. And it stars Vanessa Hudgens and Brendan Fraser. <laughs> sorry, I can't say his name without laughing. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. And um, I love Brendan Fraser, but I, I he he's hilarious and. Um, <laughs> Uh, who else is in it? Rosario Dawson. And anyway, but they, um, but okay. So the movie has a pro-life message. Mm-hmm. And I saw an interview with the director, and he was talking about how difficult it is in Hollywood to get a conservative movie made. Yeah. And that to me is is the problem because mm-hmm. it's like you're saying, like you've already made your mind up about how you feel, right? Yeah. And and Hollywood. And it sucks because you kind of know that if it's a big movie, it's probably going to lean one way. Yeah. It's not going to present both ways. It's not going to present, you know, reality. It's just going to present one side of the issue, and that is the liberal side. And so, you know, not to, not to get into politics or anything, but... Yeah. But but the I feel like that's the problem with the, with the American film... You know, system yeah. is that is that they present one side of the issue, and there's nothing on the other side, and um, and how hard it is to get a movie made. In in that one is way, do you feel that way? In one way, it's like it, it, maybe this is too hyperbolic, but it's kind of irresponsible filmmaking when you can't yeah. show at least you know because their whole thing is like, well, why would rich people keep all their money to themselves? Oh, because they're they're evil, and you know, mm-hmm. it's just like. There and let me see. There will be blood. Was about capitalism. We talked about it earlier. It was about you know you know greed, capitalism, and what people don't understand and they don't take the time to learn is like at least I know that you know the left thinks they're helping people. You Mm -hmm. know the left thinks that people can't make good decisions by themselves and they mean well. That's fine, but there's a difference between meaning well and then mandating that people make choices that you declare to be good. Mm -hmm. You know. Like yeah. everyone's obsessed with secondhand smoke because they don't like people smoking. Never mind that e-cigarettes are a much safer alternative and don't mm-hmm. to produce secondhand smoke. They're harmful. That's not good enough for them. It's like, oh, it, no, we just don't like people smoking. Where yes, it, agreed, it's not healthy. It's not healthy for anybody. It, it does mm-hmm. not improve anyone's health. Period. Yeah. But it's still people's choice. So right. if it's my choice to be rich, you know, and I like to keep all my money, I'm entitled to that. It's my money. Mm-hmm. Now if now you can what you can indict is being an asshole 
you know, if Daniel Plainview makes a, millions of dollars on oil and doesn't give it to anybody, that's his prerogative. Mm. Is he an yeah. asshole? It depends on how he goes about it. In the movie, yes. Yes. He, <laughs> yeah. he, he's, he's, a, he's an asshole. But, yeah. um... I've abandoned my child! I've abandoned my I've boy! I've abandoned my boy! Give me the blood, Eli! Give me the blood! <laughs> um, but either movies don't have brains, you know, there's just, like, action, 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 and then... Right. Which is... That's better... That's less inflammatory to me than, than irresponsible things. Like, because Elysium, it's not like... Hey, the rich people all live on Elysium. It's like, oh, but you know what? Also, they have um, in this future. Thanks. In this future, they have machines. It's kind of like that machine in Prometheus that it scans, it finds out what ailment you have, and it heals you instantly. Yeah. And so their whole thing is the rich people have these machines that heal any disease like right away. Like mm-hmm. someone has leukemia, and they just step in there, boom, leukemia is gone. Yeah. And so it's like, well, obviously, if they had these machines, I'm sure mm-hmm. they'd give you guys at least one of them. Like, right, I don't think right. they'd take all the healing machines and say, well, see you guys, you can all just die down on Earth. Because that, that's right. irresponsible to me. If mm-hmm. there was some kind of thing like, well, it just costs too much to bring, you know. But they, they paint the rich people like, they all just took all the awesome shit that would make them survive as a species, and they left us down here to die. And it's like, right. okay, I, I get it, you think they're evil, but mm-hmm. it's just... I don't know if I'm mad at them or I'm mad at the American public for looking at that and going like, oh, all rich people must be like that. But that's what happens. People get indoctrinated because they they take movies as gospel. And they don't, you know, I don't know. They don't get the time. It's true. I don't know. And and, and I agree with you. Like, I get get blockbuster fatigue really quickly. But on the other hand, I I almost enjoy watching blockbusters more because I know Men of Steel isn't going to try to shove anything... Any propaganda, you know I mean? yeah. Yeah, it, it's not, it's not, like, and I know that that's probably the wrong way to look at it, because art should be self-expression. Yeah. But the problem is that it never feels that way. Like, very rarely does it feel like somebody had something to say with this. It just feels like somebody wanted to push their agenda. You know what that's, I mean? And there's that's a difference. Why, that's why documentaries, like, almost every documentary is good, because... Yeah. It's inherent. It's not inherent in narrative storytelling mm-hmm. to tell a balanced story from both sides. Right. It it yeah. makes it better yeah. if you do. Mm-hmm. But documentaries are not good unless they present both sides. Right. Exactly. Like so, it, it's an. That's what they taught us. Like you need to approach people who think this way. Even a good story on the news, they say you need to get reaction from both sides of the issue to present exactly. present a balanced you know take on it. Um, right. Otherwise, it is kind of irresponsible, and so if that's irresponsible in the news, and mm-hmm. major networks do that, but yeah. it's still, it's, I, I would indict them too. Like it's 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 irresponsible, and right. maybe narrative filmmaking they consider that like, hey, it's fair game, and it is. Sure. But that's why people prefer like uh, people. I don't know. I, I I just think the best kind of art would at least let you decide. Because that's what I believe. I, I believe in letting people decide. I don't believe in, you know, one institution deciding what's good for people. See, it's a, it's, it's a really fine line because, you know, let's assume I was writing a movie. Yeah. The movie's going to lean towards what I believe. Yes. It just, it just is. Yeah. And, and so I understand that. And so, but at the same time, is that irresponsible of me to just present what I think? Or is that self-expression? The problem I, that I feel is that when I watch a movie like, like Elysium or whatever, because you know whatever, and I haven't seen it, but I'm assuming here, mm-hmm. it, that that movie, the screenwriter, did Neil Blomkamp write that? I believe he did. Okay, well, well, let's assume you know that he he wrote this movie and he it's it is the way it is because it's what he believes. That's what he he's choosing to express himself. Well. To me, the problem is that there's so many hands in that. Like, the screenwriter gets gets shut out because the studio says, well, it needs to do this. And the, the actors say it needs to do this. And you yeah. get someone like Matt Damon who, who wants at least a little bit of control over, you know, the whole thing. Or Edward Norton, who we know likes to have control over the mm-hmm. story. Um, you get so many hands in there that it doesn't feel like self-expression anymore. So at the, at the base level, the screenwriter should be able to write whatever they want. But to me, sometimes it comes across as being 
you know, irresponsible because it only presents, or, or like it hits you over the head with something. You know, I, I can't really. Yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? Like it's. It ceases it, it being a story, and it becomes yeah. a message. And there's nothing wrong with yeah. a message, but people don't need to. He- you know, they'll. You, what you're trying to, if you want to tell me a message, just give me a speech. Right. But if you want to tell me a story, then tell me a story. Right. And it's, that's that's my problem. Yeah, no, it's very true, and, and it's like like Captain Phillips or something. Mm-hmm. Like, that's based on a true story, so they have sort of a framework mm-hmm. to start with. But as, as they're writing the film, it's going to become whatever that screenwriter intends it to become. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Anymore. It's like nobody, nobody wants to admit that they're making a movie just to... Just to tell a story, like they're all like, "Well, I want to make a movie about this thing that I believe in." It's like, it's like, you don't. You, no one's going to punish you for not having a profound answer. You can just say, "I just thought this story would be cool, so yeah." And then right. they picked me. No one wants right. to admit that you know they wanted to make a Captain Phillips movie, and I'm just the director that you know that they settled on. Like, right? There has to be like, some kind of grand reason that you're doing this. Like, it's your magnum opus. Exactly. And if you look at Captain Phillips, like, like. It basically is just the story of what happened. Yeah. Like, there's there's really not, like, deep, you know, philosophical, life-changing yeah. things happening here. But, you know, it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I hardly I, ever, I feel like, like... I should have started this because I don't know how, to, how, to, how I really feel about it. But I'm in the middle because, because the artist in me says that the artist should be able to express himself. Well, then... But then my- the other part of me, as the consumer, says... I'm tired of seeing the same expression over and over and over. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess I guess then I would remedy it and say, I believe, yeah, artists should be able to, to tell whatever kind of story, however they want to, because that's yeah. their right. But, you know, I, I wish people would... I guess it's just more like, I'm not going to tell them what they should do, but it would mm-hmm. behoove them, and it would help their storytelling and the, the overall efficacy of their movies if they were to present it a little more responsibly and and sure. and two-sided. Um, right, true. You know, because cause then it begs questions, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, I don't know. It's, it's like, the, yeah. yeah, I just, I, 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 there, there, I can't really think of really many movies I like that I like mm-hmm. because of the message. I like Cast yeah. Away because it's a cool story and it's shot well. Right. You know, I just, I like it. I like watching it. Yeah. You know, so yeah. what, what do you mean? What do you, well, what do you what do you think about what it says about um, how obsessed we are with time? It's like I don't care. Yeah. He's stuck on an island, and it's Tom. Yeah, yeah. Tom. Who's it, Tom Cruise. Tom Hanks on <laughs> on screen. By that himself. would be a completely different movie. Yeah, yeah. He'd be like wind sprinting up the beach every day. Um, he would be. Yes. You know, um, he'd just be running a lot. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't get that much more complicated for me. I just I like sure those kind of movies and when I, 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 I'm trying to think of something else to counter like I I don't know I like United 93 because of the message because the message is like oh that's not even a message that's a story too it's yeah. like hey look at these people who you know this could have been another plane that hit another um, target mm-hmm. and um, these people were like hey we know we're going to die but we may as well die taking down this, taking down these guys right and right. um that's was, I love that movie. I don't watch yeah. it every day, you know. Like, but it's see, and 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 that's a good point too, because because in, you know, I'm I'm sitting here thinking about my favorite movies, and and the ones that I like, I like the story, and and maybe there's another a, a deeper meaning yeah. or a deeper truth behind it, yeah. like you know, Back to the Future. I don't know. It, if the deeper message is like you, you can affect change in your life. Like you can choose, yeah. you know, to, to a, a better future for yourself. Yeah. You know, whatever it is, like, yeah, that's a cool message, but that's not why I watch it. No. Like, you know what I mean? And so maybe that makes me a superficial viewer because I'm just watching that that base level. But at the same time, like, stories throughout throughout time, throughout history, stories have been, you know, stories. I mean, Breaking Bad, one of the reasons it's really good, I mean, mm. aside from how it's filmed, and I mean, the story itself is riveting, but like, as I, you know, I told you about the book that Mrs. Hooper gave me about, mm-hmm. and about the philosophical end of it, that we've already, mm-hmm. you know, we've talked about before, it, like, it does have a deeper meaning, but it's not one-sided, it's not like, hey, you know, 
um, it's basically like this person was put in this situation and here's what they did with it at what point mm -hmm. at what point do you draw the line what would you have done like there's a lot of questions and the only really judgment of Walt that we have is you know it, uh, are his, his his justifications for his actions. And it's right. more of, look at this interesting... Like, even as the viewer, like, you don't really judge him. Yeah. You know? This is true. And and I think I think Breaking Bad's probably a good example because it's, it's a great story, yeah. and you can go a level deeper, but what it does is it presents truth and it presents honesty yeah. and, and something that everybody can relate to, no matter... Their, their own political or religious or whatever, you know, presuppositions that they come to the show with. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for instance, when I watch the show, I see it as, as like a, a, a warning. It, it's very biblical to me. It's, it's the story of King David who, who you know, it, who is caught up in sin and it destroys him. Or, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's all of these people. Like, that is, to me, it's a very biblical story. But if you were not religious... Yeah, you can still be very close to that show because it still presents truth, and I guess I guess that's what I like is is something that presents honesty and says no matter who you are and no matter who we are, you can relate to this story just the same as everybody else in the world. Does that make sense? Whether you're rich or you're poor, everybody yeah. can get caught up in that in that story. Yeah, yeah. I guess I just wish that, like, there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with people thinking, I mean, obviously in Elysium, yes, those rich people are bad people. They build a world in the sky, they don't let people in a certain tax bracket, I guess, come with them mm -hmm. to it. They have these machines that heal all diseases, they take all of them up there with them, and everyone who knows how to make one, I guess, um... Yeah. You know, they take all the, the the landscapers, you know, and all the you right, know, right. people that make things look nice, and then they leave all the factory workers and people without jobs and people without health insurance down on Earth, and let them just ruin it. And mm -hmm. when people attempt to come to Earth, or when people attempt to fly from Earth to Elysium to heal their mm -hmm. dying children, um, the people in Elysium, Jodie Foster has them shot down out of the sky, and if they yeah. show up there, they're killed. Okay, yes, those people are bad. But yeah. they're not bad because they're rich. They're bad because yeah. they're murderers. Evil. Yeah. And they're assholes. Yes. Exactly. They happen to be rich. Yeah, so, this is true. Yes, those people are... That's why I could overall was okay with Elysium, because it was fun to watch and whatever. But it was forgettable, and when you run with that idea, you label and you start to think, oh, rich people. And it's like, you harken back to, oh, like the ones in Elysium? Oh, they would probably try to keep every advantage in life away from me if they could, you know, even yeah. if they had to kill me. It's like, well, that's what yeah. that's what these kind of things do to people. That's right. And it's just, it's, but anyway, that was yeah. Elysium. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> That yeah. opened a whole can of worms I didn't expect it to. Yeah. Um, well, um, we can touch on this for a minute, um, but uh, did you... Did you watch uh, Sherlock, Series 3? I did. I got through all three episodes of Sherlock. Awesome. Yeah. What did you... Uh, what What were your initial sort of impressions? I'm trying to remember if Series 2 was that different from Series 1. It felt like this mm. one was pretty different, but it could have just been yeah. the hiatus. Um, mm. But um, I liked it, but I don't know if I liked it as much yeah. as I liked Series 2. Sure. That that's where I'm at too. It it felt it felt really different. Um, yeah. Not not necessarily in a bad way. It just no. was different. Um, and maybe that's good. You know. Sure. I feel like this was the the character development season. Yeah. You know, it was like it was all about character because how many murder mysteries were there in those three episodes? One. Yeah. Like yeah, it's yeah. So so to me it wasn't really even like a mystery show this season. It was more like here's Sherlock being thrust into situations that he doesn't like and how he deals with them. Yeah. And uh, and so it's very character development y that way. Um, <clears throat> and then and then there's also sort of like the, the absence of a big, you know, overarching Moriarty kind of figure yeah. that that maybe makes it feel a little different. Um but uh, 
but yeah, I thought it was I thought it was good, and you know, I, it it may be the weakest season. Yeah, overall. But it, it's um, not it's not that it's the weakest one and accomplishes nothing, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I, I feel like I feel like if if we spent this year, these three episodes looking at you know character development, then next year. If it's if it's just simply mystery after mystery after mystery, then it won't feel terrible because we got all the character development from the previous season. Yeah, and uh, I mean there was a lot going on with Sherlock this yeah. time around, and him and John too. Oh yeah, and John, and yeah. I mean imagine like all that stuff with like Sherlock and you know when he was spoiler spoiler alert guys <clears throat> when he was shot and um, I lo- I loved that. Yeah, I did too. And you get to see like him as a child and like all of these things and yeah. and we got to see Sherlock's parents and we got to see um you know, it, it was just yeah. um it was kind of kinda of cool, I thought. I mean it was different, but it was cool. And, yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think um the 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 big bad guy at the end of the third episode, um, while he wasn't exactly Moriarty, I thought yeah. he was pretty cool. Like, um Kind of like a an anti Sherlock because he even had like the vision he had the mind, yeah, palace, the mind palace and he had the like all of, like where he would see text around people and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool. I was so confused about like his glasses. Were they? Yeah. Like I guess they're in his mind, but like is that was that just his way of seeing? Yeah, it was. That was his way of like, assessing. Yeah, like Sherlock I thought he was like an yeah. like an android or something. It was like those scouters that the Saiyans wear. In I thought Dragon I Ball thought Z. it was, yeah, yeah. I thought it was in his glasses, and it was like somebody feeding him information. Like right. I figured it was Moriarty or something. But uh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. But but when Sherlock took the guy's glasses off, there was nothing in them. Mm-hmm. So so maybe not. But. Uh, yeah, I took that completely literally. Literally, I was like, "Does he have like a cyborg eye? Like, what's that? What's going on?" I did too. This guy? I did t- yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no, I thought that was cool. And that was uh, that was Lars Mikkelsen. It was uh, Mads Mikkelsen's brother. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I thought that voice sounded familiar. That accent, at least. I was yeah. like, "God, who does he remind me of?" Yeah, he's and he was he was a villain in the uh, Conan Doyle stories too. Uh, although his name was a little different. I think in this it was. Uh, oh, I don't remember. They changed his last name to to match the, the nationality of Lars Mikkelsen, and so that's that was the thing. Charles Augustus Magnuson was it, it. That's what it was in this, I think. And in the story, in the Conan Doyle stories, it was Charles Augustus something British. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, coffee no, it was cool. Him. Coffee. Yeah, but it was he was uh, yeah it was all very good and, and uh, I enjoyed it. I mean, the the one the one part that 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 worried me was when you see Sherlock with um, with that girl in the third episode. Um, I can't remember her name now, but um, yeah, Mary's maid of honor or whatever. And yeah. uh, you you see them together, and I thought like, okay, if this That's is for weird. real. Yeah, they've ru- they've ruined like they've lost the character. Yeah, me. yeah. But of course it, it was right. Exactly. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, but he wouldn't tolerate, you know, the you yeah. Know, he wouldn't no. Exactly. But uh, yeah, that turned out okay for me. I was alright with that. Um, yeah, me too. I guess now now we gotta wait for. It's more like I guess I got my fill. I was I had a lot more fun episode to episode in series two. Yeah, I guess it was because of all the Moriarty stuff and how that wasn't here now. Um, but I guess that that's just what happens when it gets to bigger stuff. There's less dealing with, you know, Lestrade and, mm-hmm. you know. What did you think about the uh, the, the twist with Mary? Um, I guess I still didn't quite understand that. I mean, I as I understood it, she, like, she's just... There's, I guess there'll be more to be revealed about that next mm-hmm. series, but I guess she was... I don't know, was she assigned to John, or does it, did it just end up... I, I didn't really understand how she even... Like, was she... I don't know. I, I don't think we know the specifics, but, uh-huh. but she was at least, at some point, a secret agent 
of some sort. Yeah. And, you know, I don't even know. Maybe she's a a wet worker, an assassin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's... Yeah, it's weird because, you know, obviously that was not a part of the Conan Doyle stuff. Right. So the the purist in me says, like, okay, that was that was a misstep. But, but at the same time, like, I mean, it was interesting, I guess, and it, it gave a little complication for John to have to deal with. And, um, and I thought he dealt with it in a, in a, in a very true-to-character way yeah. by just, just saying, okay, you are who you are, and I don't care who you were. Um, and uh, and I felt like that was that was kind of a sweet moment and, and true to his character and uh, yeah you know I don't know did you know that the people that played uh, Sherlock's parents are actually Benedict Cumberbatch's parents did you know that that the woman who plays Mary is Mark Freeman's wife I did yeah that's really weird that they were like oh just, do you think I wonder if it was just lazy on their parts or that just worked out <laughs> that way yeah I don't know still in the office like here's a check yeah. Um, I didn't know that those were his real parents, though. They are. I would have expected his dad to have an equally scary, deep voice. <laughs> if you look at his mother, though, like she lo- like he looks like his mom. <sighs> like look up a picture of her. It's like oh, yep, I can see it's it now. Wait, right, come back. Say hello to Dustin at least. Is he on the actual screen? Yeah, he's on the screen. I'm so used to you guys not being on screen. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? I'm not short sure enough. No. <laughs> okay, I'm really here. All right, bye. Bye. Justin, bye. Hey, bye. Oh, you do. My poor car is like the only car that has eyes underneath itself. So. Really? Oh, underneath it. Yeah. All right, drive safe. Oh, can you make sure the clothes up off the floor? Yeah, I'll, I'll get up off the floor. She's just, I think she's falling asleep. So. I'm like, I'm just... Yeah. Uh... I was, I was pleased with it overall, I guess. I guess, I, yeah. I don't know if I had my hopes high or what, but um, I, I yeah. wasn't disappointed. Yeah, me neither. I, I feel like I didn't quite get, like you put it, I didn't quite get my fill, but I don't yeah. know if that was just because I just want more than three episodes or or what it is. Yeah. But, but they did cross another thing off my list of, like, things that they have to do for it to be Sherlock Holmes. Mm-hmm. And um, which I thought was good. They they did um, well two things. They did John and Mary, and mm-hmm. they did um, Sherlock's substance abuse. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, they did do that. I was surprised. I figured they wouldn't do that. Just because it would make him look bad. Yeah, and and it, it's it's such a different thing now than it was in <laughs> in uh, the Victorian days. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, I, I guess there's still one thing though, that they still need to make Sherlock do. He needs a pipe. I don't think we've ever seen him smoke a pipe. I guess that's what the cigarettes are supposed to be. Yeah, I know, but Uh screw it. I want a (laughs) pipe. Um, I'd like to see him, he needs, I I guess I'm not going to go this direction with him, but Mm. it's something they did. Maybe a little too much in the whole, in the uh, Guy Ritchie films, but he needs to mm-hmm. at least be a competent hand to hand fighter. Well, but Sherlock never was that, except for in the Guy Ritchie movies. He he was in the books though. I don't know if he was like not, a uh, he wasn't really a thug, but he knew how to handle himself. But I guess yeah, they're not. Kinda. I guess I guess to them maybe they're just like we can just write some much more clever stuff than him having to fight somebody. Sure. I would just think it's, at some point, like, wouldn't it make sense that someone physically confronts him? Like, I don't know. It just seems like yeah, conveniently, you know, they make their way into a, into a situation, and whoever's the threat, you know, is okay with mm-hmm. talking their way out. I don't know. It just seems like. See, well, I guess I guess my thing is like the the original stories. He may I I can't think of a point where he fought anybody, but I you know I could be. Blanking on, and I haven't read everything that I'd have to double. Wrote, but, I'd have to double check too. But um, but it, it probably did happen. Um, but it was always sort of like a last resort, or like a um, like that's just a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and 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 it's always sort of more about him deducing and and throwing people off just by deducing so much about them, mm-hmm. and uh, and just being 
smarter than everybody to the point, to the degree that nobody even wants to cross him because they know he'll best them in everything. And uh, so, you know, in that, like, I love the Guy Ritchie. Well, I love the first film. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love the last, like, 15 or 20 minutes of the of the second film. Yeah. And, um, but if you notice, the last 15 or 20 minutes of the of the second film is is not any fighting. It's just talking. Right. Um, but the first one I love, and, and, and it's, um, I think, um, I think having him fight, having him be a brawler was a very smart move mm-hmm. to modernize him and to give him more, a more interesting ability, you know, since you're setting him back in time, like when, when he was yeah. supposed to be, just to sort of make it, have more mainstream appeal, I guess. Yeah. Um, I felt like that was a good, that was a, that was an okay move. I, I didn't mind it, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know how I'd feel about it in Sherlock. I think it might, might throw me a little bit, maybe because I don't feel like, I don't feel like Benedict Cumberbatch could handle himself as well as Robert Downey Jr. I don't know what it is. Yeah. I don't know. I get, I, I don't know. I, I suppose at some point there, I'd be amazed if he got through every situation he gets into without having to at least, punch somebody. Sure. But especially nowadays, yeah. I I definitely that wouldn't want it to be at the forefront though, because then it is a little bit too much. But I would have expected mm-hmm. at some point, like, at least show me what he would do. Like Yeah. You know, I would think that he would just know a couple like a couple of key things, you know. Sure. Uh, I don't know. Like John fights more yeah. than him. I was just like, yeah. alright well it's interesting. True. Like John broke John broke that guy's arm or he sprained it. Mm-hmm. He didn't break it. Yeah. Um I don't know. I, li- but, I like uh, their take on on Watson being addicted to, like, uh, adventure, being yeah. ad- addicted to that lifestyle. Well, I feel like, like that was the, kind of a... opposite of Bilbo, I guess. Yeah. Well, for until real. well until his arc, I suppose. But that's interesting. Yeah. You know, I never during this I never really thought of Bilbo, which I think is a yeah, me neither. A testament to him. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I was, I was a little worried. I was a little worried I'd see Khan too. And I never did. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen so, Benedict Cumberbatch in anything else, so, I mean, I'm st- I've still got the okay. picture like glasses yeah. on. Yeah, I, I haven't. Sure. I, haven't, I don't think I've watched one thing. Um, actually, Mrs. Hooper was watching Parade's End, so I saw a little bit of him in that. Mm. Okay. But, um, yeah. That was just a sadder, average intelligence Sherlock. But it was, mm. <laughs> I don't know. He plays an American in August Osage County. Yeah, he's, Which is in, interesting. he's in a lot of stuff, but I haven't seen him in much. I think he was in War Horse, too, but I'll... He was, yeah. Yeah. Wasn't Loki in that, also? Yeah, he was. It was Tom Hiddleston, yeah. Yeah, he was. He was in that. No. Yeah. That movie wasn't but, as bad uh, as people were saying. It was like, War Horse sucks. I was like, oh, it was pretty good. I liked it. I yeah. thought it was good. Yeah. I mean, it's a little long. It was but... a little sentimental, too, but... Yeah, yeah. It, it was effective. Yeah. Yeah, it was very much like old school to me. It was yeah. very, it was like John Ford, like like Black Beauty shots and yeah, 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 yeah that too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it was yeah, I, I liked it. I don't know, whatever. Yeah. I'm also a Spielberg nut, so yeah, that could also be part of it. But uh, oh, I was going to ask you about the snow. D- <laughs> tell tell me about what happened in Alabama. Well, from my perspective in the news, um, we. I'd heard vaguely, like, that'd be some cold, blah, blah, blah. I didn't really know much, but um, I just know that we ran cut-ins every half hour um, at the news, and then we went on at four, and then we went on at five, and then we stayed on until, like, 6.45, and then we did cut-ins on the half hour, and then I did, or no, they did, uh, they kept, they stayed on the air through six, and then through seven, and then I directed, uh, a, a big long cut in without commercial breaks on the CW at eight, and then we did the nine o'clock show until eleven fifteen. Wow! So I was like, okay, well now I'm going home. Blah blah. I go outside, and all of our cars are frozen shut because yeah. of the sleet. It was sleeting all day, so hmm. you know that's accumulate. That was slowly accumulating throughout the day. Sure. Um, but then I used everyone's car shut, and so it took me thirty minutes to open my car, and hmm. then start it. 
and then um, I finally got it cranked, but then my wipers wouldn't work, but at least I got everything clear, and it wasn't sleeting anymore, so I wouldn't need them. And then uh, I was like, oh, my phone has 2% battery left, and I've never driven mm -hmm. in ice before. So I was like, well, I'm going back inside, and so I charged my phone some more. And mm -hmm. um, I was driving home really slow, and I skidded like every three or five seconds yeah. um, driving straight and yeah, going yeah. up hills and stuff. So I made it home. But I, I, admittedly, like when I got home, I was like, "I'm lucky to have made it." Like, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then the next day, I did kind of the same thing, and mm -hmm. um, a little bit this morning too. And then today, I busted my ass putting the leaf blower back in the shed. Really? Um, yeah, so it was all, it was on concrete, and so it was mm -hmm. iced over, and I, I slipped and fell on like my keys and all my stuff, and oh, I didn't feel it sucks. because I was so layered up. But I, I got yeah, up yeah. and. There was like a big crack where my body <laughs> fell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's awesome. But I know that in Atlanta, like everyone, you know, a lot of thing, a lot of what happened in Atlanta seemed to be that it just everyone, nobody, usually up north, they close things before this happens. Yeah. And I don't think anyone here knew like it would ice up because the the models. I think the the, the models were telling were telling the meteorologists one thing and then another mm -hmm. thing actually happened well we knew it was going to snow yeah i don't i don't know that we had a a, a clear indication of how much and how fast and how yeah. much of it would stick um but you know basically yeah you're right ba up north everybody kind of knows beforehand okay let's shut everything down and here we usually do that also but the problem was i guess they took a gamble and said let's let's let everybody go to school and let everybody go to work and then when when it actually started snowing and it became apparent like okay this is going to be a problem then everybody it, it was like it was like everybody left at the exact same time so you have everybody leaving the government offices, everybody leaving from you know just general retail stores that were being mm -hmm. that were being closed, and and then obviously school buses, everything leaving and going on the same road at the exact same time, and you know Atlanta is congested enough, much less when everybody's trying to do the exact same thing and it's snowing, and um, so it just became it just became a, a nightmare really quick, and um, you know I have family and friends who were in the snow or were in the in the in the on the roads for hours like for like what typically is like a 15 or 20 minute commute for hours they were on the road because i think in here um just in my county alone there were like 200 car accidents and then uh in like cherokee county there were over 300 and it's just it was just a, it's sort of a nightmare like all at once and so it wasn't so much the snow that ru that kind of made the congestion. It was just the fact that everybody was trying to leave at the exact same time. And then all the car wrecks. But, yeah, I don't know. It was, yeah. it was, it was ridiculous. There's still snow on the ground outside. Um, like, it's stuck this long. The roads are pretty much clear. They're a little wet, but they're pretty much clear. Yeah. And, uh, but, but there is snow on the ground still. Yeah, we've got, I've still got some ice out here, um, mm -hmm. you know, on some of the roofs and uh, and under some of the bridges there's still ice because they're not getting any sunlight. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how long it'll be till my windshield wipers work. Um, yeah. So I just hope uh, we don't need them. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I was like halfway through moving last night when they fogged up again and I was just like, oh god, I can't oh, see yeah. at all. So I was just like, <laughs> oh, I just sort of stopped and... Yeah, it was it was kind of scary, man. I was I was I don't wish to go through it again. Um, yeah, and I posted well, you know a, uh, some article I saw about why it happened and and mm -hmm. why everyone's talking shit about the South because they weren't prepared for snow and it's like well no, but I wanted to shoot back like who wasn't prepared for a fucking hurricane? Yeah, that's what I thought. Shut yeah. up. You know like. Uh, you right. know, I'm not going to give you shit because hurricanes don't happen to you guys, like, you know, or tornadoes or anything else. Like, don't, you know, we don't 
get ice storms. We don't get snow, you know, and no, yeah. nobody down here is used to driving on <clears throat> ice because they live down here where ice is in your fridge or your cooler yeah. for beer. Right, right. That's right. And that's it. Yeah, and that's it. Hey, Hooper. Yo. Some news just broke that I want to talk about really quick. Uh-oh, what happened? And 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 <laughs> I want to get your, your initial reaction to this as, uh, as well. All right. <clears throat> They've just announced two actors for Batman Superman. The first casting decision I can I can get behind. They've cast Alfred. Uh-oh. And it is Jeremy Irons. Ooh. Now that I can deal with. That sounds good. Yeah. I, I hope I hope they give him a, like a little bit of like sarcastic wit, mm-hmm. and uh, but I think I think uh, I think that'll work. Yeah, I can get behind that. But the next, <laughs> I can't even say this without laughing because it sounds like a joke. The next piece of information is Lex Luthor. Oh dear. Now let me let me tell you some of the names that that have been associated with this role before: Brian Cranston, mm-hmm. Mark Strong. Uh, Terry O'Quinn, Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix, they've all been they've all been mentioned for Lex Luthor. Joaquin Phoenix is with, the most interesting one of those choices because he's he the only really one who's is. not already bald. Yeah, and and because I feel like he could play like a like a completely calm, centered, like uh, you know, anger under the surface kind of guy. Uh huh. Um, and and I mean, so can the other two guys, but they're already bald and they're kind of older and whatever. yeah and they've already done it a few times um but okay this sounds like a joke connor i hooper i don't i don't even know if i can say this without it sounding like a joke they have cast in the role of lex luthor superman's greatest foe jesse eisenberg I, I'm not even joking. That's I wish that's I was, a terrible decision. I wish I was joking. I'm not joking. An Olympic caliber physical specimen. And you picked a guy who's skinnier than me. I You, you picked the kid from Zombieland? Well, but... Oh I'm not even going to say... Oh, and you picked Mark Zuckerberg. Like, Forget that he's done a movie that... It was generally liked by everyone and considered, yeah. uh, you know, a big step for him. You picked him to play Lex Luthor? But see, here's the thing. Like, like, yeah, in my perfect mind, Lex has toned his body because he he is trying to be Superman. He's trying to be the ideal. Um, but, but, but even if they had gone with somebody that was, like, obese, like, okay, that's fine. As long mm-hmm. as he can play, you know, calm... He can play centered. He can play a a a well loved public figure who who can have the crowd eating out of his hand. Um, who I mean, he's not showy like like Tony Stark, but he's just suave and charismatic and completely in control of every situation. That is Lex Luthor, regardless of what he looks like or, or anything. That that is the key concept of Lex Luthor. Now, to me, even though they've never really done it much in the comics as much as I wish they would have, my idea of Lex is that he's always trying to be the ideal man, Mm -hmm. and here's Superman, who is the ideal man, and he didn't even have to try. You know, Superman just is, and he Mm -hmm. was born that way. Lex has had to build himself up, and so that's why he hates Superman, because he's jealous of Superman, Mm -hmm. and he's the opposite of Superman while trying to be Superman. And and so that to me that is what makes him interesting. I don't think Jesse Eisenberg. It, you can shave his head and and whatever, and maybe he'd kind of look like Lex. I don't know. Put him in a nice you know tailored suit. I don't know, but but can he play? Can he play what I just described? I'll never say an actor can't play something a certain way, but there are physical limitations in my opinion. That you just can't get past. And I'm not going to say he can't play Lex Luthor because he can't, you know, gain the muscle or whatever and blah, blah, blah. But, like, 
I get, I'll go back to my first choice. My first choice would have been Mark Strong or or mm. or a a comparable unknown. You know, sure. like just like with Batman, like bat, my 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 um my ideal for Batman and Lex Luthor were both very similar. It was sure for both of them. Like you know, I want you know a tall you know a tall dude who's in shape, mm. um, who has a deep voice. Mm-hmm. And um, and you know him and Batman are pretty similar in the way that they project themselves they socially. You know, yeah. so you could have had a bunch of people interviewing for Lex and Batman, and then sort of done. I mean, kind of like how um, Chris Hemsworth and uh, Tom Hiddleston were both interviewed for um, both interviewed for uh, they both auditioned for for Thor, for Thor, and they went for the opposite roles. I think. But yeah, Kenneth Branagh did swap them. Yeah, he he swapped them, and I think that. They could have done the same thing with with Batman and with Lex Luthor. I just don't think. Sure. To me, it's like, all right, if you're gonna, what's been done with Lex Luthor before? Okay, they had Gene Hackman. Yeah. And you know he was fine, but to me it was always like you have this fresh new, you know, mm-hmm. crop of people to pick from, to present, mm-hmm. you know, in what in my opinion, a youth, not not, not youthful like. Jesse right. Eisenberg lo- looks like a rich kid, like a rich he does, yeah. kid whose whose daddy just handed him a company. You know he doesn't. Think, he doesn't strike me as like a as a as a ground up, built myself up, mm-hmm. you know, to an ideal kind of person. He's like a waifish, right. you know. He just Mark Strong would have been my choice just because he's me too. he projects confidence and he projects likability, but he can mm-hmm. also play anger and he's got an intimidating voice, an intimidating look, just the his eyebrows, his whole face, yeah. just all that. Mm-hmm. Jesse Eisenberg could scowl. You know, could, could could do his best Hulk face, and he. I just, I'm not scared of him. No, well, I, but imagine. Okay, Jesse so Eisenberg here, looks like he's going to shoot up a school. He doesn't look like Lex Luthor. Right. To to go back to your point about Bruce Wayne, you know, that's one of the many things that I think is interesting about Lex Luthor, because Lex and Bruce are very similar, and they're both they're both you know rich, and they both project the same thing to society. They both. Um, socialize similarly. They um, they both devote themselves to something, but the the difference and and honestly, they're both devoting themselves to making things better. Yeah. The problem is the the links that Lex is willing to go to make things better. Right. And that is what makes. See, Superman's in the middle, and he's he's friends. Maybe his best friend in the world is Bruce Wayne. Mm-hmm. Maybe, and his worst enemy is Luthor, and they're the same. There's just one little thing that's different about them. Yeah. And that, to me, is one of the many things that's interesting about Lex Luthor. And Luthor, to me, is up there with the Joker, tied for the best, most intriguing villain that has ever been written. Um, in, at least in superhero lore, anyway. But but so imagine imagine the shot in your head of, of you know, it's a profile of Henry Cavill. And he's, he's staring Lex Luthor down. Mm-hmm. Right, and imagine Je- Jesse Eisenberg as Luthor. They're staring each other down. Does it look like either one? Like who? Who's going to win that fight? That's the question. Like for me, I like to have a Luthor who will look into Superman's eyes, and as the audience member, I'm saying either one of them could come out on top right now. Like at least Luthor, like you'd know that. Okay, yeah, if it came just a fist fight, Superman would punch Luthor once in the head, and his brain would explode. Dead. But, exactly. like, at least if Mark Strong, looking at Henry Cavill, you have him stare at Superman and say, I'm not scared of you. And you can have Jesse Eisenberg say the same thing. But mm-hmm. with Jesse Eisenberg, it seems more like uh, out of ignorance that he's not scared of him. Yeah. And not out right. of, like, confidence. Like, no, you understand, exactly. I have the resources to stop you, um, mm-hmm. and you have no idea what I'm capable of. Jesse Eisenberg looks like he's just going, I hate you, Dad. I don't ever want to yeah. see you again. It's like, uh-huh. I don't, I wouldn't even have picked him to play Robin. Like, no, it's just, it's... Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a terrible choice if that's if that's if that's not a hoax. I would have rather had Jer- it all over the place. I would have rather seen Jeremy Irons play. play I would rather Luthor. them switch it and have Jesse Eisenberg play Alfred, <laughs> like and Jeremy Irons play Luthor. Like my God. Yeah. All right. So here's 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 the thing though. Because Jesse Eisenberg has never done it before, doesn't mm-hmm. mean he can't do it. It just means that I now have another reservation about this film. Yeah. Because and now I'm I'm thinking 
maybe this is a misstep. Mm-hmm. Maybe we and and you know I've always I've always said I I trust Zack Snyder because I know he reads comics and I know he loves Superman yeah. and he and he genuinely loves this DC universe. And so if anybody's going to bring it to life, I'd rather it be him than Christopher Nolan because Nolan Nolan has his <clears throat> prejudices. Yeah. And he would never he would never make a good Superman movie, much less Green Lantern. Yeah. Nolan can't do it, but but I know that Zack Snyder loves it. So my now I have to question Zack Snyder and say, do you really know who Luthor is? And the image that I have in my mind of who Luthor is, am I going to have to forget that in order to enjoy this film? Am I going to have to adopt a new Luthor? And and maybe that's part of adaptation, but it's like you're you're. I just don't see how you could have looked at a list of a bunch of people that I mean. It sounds, it is. sounds entitled, but like, how do you? A bunch of people I would have picked for the role, yeah. versus who you know he picked. Like, okay, he's a director. He he knows the comics more than me. Whatever. But mm-hmm. like, that just seem it just seems like a bad choice. It seems like a it, man. I don't even know because I I really want this to to work and I really want it to to be great because I'm already having to let go of Spider Man. You know, mm-hmm. I, I know I won't get a good Spider-Man movie for at least ten years, and I know that, and I and, and I hate that, but it's probably the truth. And I don't want DC to go down that road where I have to let them go and say, I'm not going to get my version until after Justice League three. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, anyway, so there you go. There's the big movie news scoop for the day, and we're well, right on top of that, dude. Well. You heard it here first on the Hoopercast. <laughs> God, that's that's. Mm. Uh, I would have rather them had a woman play Lex Luthor. What well, I just well, I don't know but, about that. Yeah, just, but I do think this. I do think this. Um, okay, compromise. I would rather have him shave Glenn Close's head and play Lex Luthor. <laughs> There you go. That's a true compromise, then. <laughs> um, Jodie Foster. So, um, so here's here's sort of the up. I don't want to say upside because there's not. <laughs> but here's the thing: Do you think that Lex Luthor, in the broadest sense, as a as a visionary, as a as a as a, you know, whatever, do you think he would be more like Mark Zuckerberg today? Do you think that's why they chose? Eisenberg. You mean because of like social media and stuff, and but do you think? Just, yeah, do you think? I guess do you think Luthor in, in, would would be a spoiled brat. Do you think Luthor would be? Uh, uh, I'm wearing a hoodie and flip flops. No, my short answer is no. I don't either. I, because I, don't either. I understand like if, if if their mentality is how the nerd is king these days, mm-hmm. they should never. They shouldn't change the character t- towards towards the times. I mean, Luthor can be, Luthor can be and is tech savvy without being a nerd. He he wears he wears an Armani suit. You know he yeah yeah he's he's because no. he's trying to be the ideal. Yeah, that's the thing. That's why he wears the Armani suit because no. he wants to be important. Yeah, he wants to be revered like Superman is. Yeah, that's the thing. So I don't know, you know, whatever. Yeah, I disapprove of that casting choice. I do too. I I, I really wish they would they would like be proactive and and give us show us what he's going to look like in the movie. Go ahead and show us him bald and and sell us over, like sell us on him as Luthor. Give him a monologue to to put out on YouTube with him being like, "I'm Luthor and show, I am." Yeah, show me his audition for president take. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Show me what he did that impressed you so much. Yeah. Because I, I love Jesse Eisenberg, but not who I had in mind. I was really hoping the Joaquin Phoenix thing would play out. Yeah, that would have been a good choice, at least. Yeah, that would have been interesting. It would have been actually really scary. Like, that guy... Just Imagine, as, it's as, like Commodus, right? I mean, Yeah, as unbalanced as, as that guy is, you know, and, and would play yeah. it. Yeah, I feel like with I feel like with Joaquin Phoenix at some point Luthor would just masturbate for no reason though, it's, <laughs> as as does seem to be just Joaquin Phoenix's thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Again, 
the master should have been called the masturbator because and you haven't even seen her yet does he jerk off in her yeah <laughs> <laughs> of course of course he does <laughs> well I mean he's dating a computer I mean what do you do <laughs> I'm pretty sure he only he only reads scripts that involve that and he's like no <laughs> it's right, in well, his contract we'd like you to uh, we'd like you to play the Dalai Lama Joaquin only if I get to masturbate at least once I don't see any masturbating in this script yeah where is hmm. it well I, he's I don't think that's really going to be appropriate for this script you've lost interest yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get to play the Wait. Dalai Lama. Uh, tough. I, I will. I can stay at home and do that. <laughs> I can stay, does. can stay at home and do a lot of things. That, that's what he did <laughs> in between when he took that break there. That's what he would have done if he had gotten this role. You know? Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Just right there, like, oh, thank God. Oh. <laughs> 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 Well, that's all the time we've got for this installment of the Hoopercast. Um, I'm working on some best ofs um, since I don't have as much time to record um, um, nowadays. But um, uh, if this if this thing, this little girl keeps me up at night um, being stubborn and not eating, I have more time to cut them together. So I'll try and have those out interspersed with this episode and others. Um Awesome. But in the meantime, I'm just going to be watching a lot of HGTV uh, with my wife. <laughs> so Sounds good. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing television. Oh. Anyway, um, and actually, I think I'm going to be moving this desk into the baby's room um, oh, okay. since we moved the crib into our room. Mm -hmm. So we might get better sound just in a more enclosed space. I don't know. Sure. So, um, That'd be cool. Yeah. We've seen a lot more All purple. Right. So Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, Dustin, I'll see you next time. All right. Thanks for having me. Woo!